Hello, welcome to VMC, I'm Dr. M. Today we are going to cover nutrition-related dilated cardiomyopathy. It's a major problem that's been popping up in the past number of years. Join me, you'll learn something. First, let's define what dilated cardiomyopathy is. DCM is when the ventricles or the lower chambers in the heart start to weaken and as a result are unable to contract to push blood to the body and to the lungs as well as they could before. There is a primary dilated cardiomyopathy that has a genetic predisposition and we see this one in breeds like the Doberman, the Irish Wolfhound, and a number of others. This is more commonly an issue in larger breed dogs than in small breed dogs. And for primary DCM, we do have medications that can be used to slow down disease progression, but we cannot stop it and we cannot reverse it. So over time, because the ventricles are weakening and they are not pushing blood forward as well as they used to, this will result in more blood pooling in the ventricles and it will cause the ventricles to dilate. Once the disease worsens from there, you will start to get fluid accumulation in the body. And this part of the disease process we call congestive heart failure. This is more end stage DCM. There are also secondary forms of DCM. Some of these are related to toxins, and actually the most common is a side effect to a chemo medication in our dogs. We also have an infectious category, and the most common cause for DCM that's infectious is actually parvovirus. When there are puppies that are between two and four weeks of age that get parvo, they are more likely to develop DCM because of how that virus attacks their body at that age. And the third type of secondary DCM is nutrition related and that's the one that we're going to cover in detail today. Now no matter which type of DCM a dog or cat might have, the symptoms look very much the same. You can see fatigue, you can see breathlessness, you can see an intolerance to exercise, you can see an increased respiratory rate, you can see fluid accumulations swelling the abdomen or the belly of the animal, you can also see pale gums. Some animals will have a decreased appetite, others might have some fainting, and sometimes the only symptom that you get is sudden death, where the animal compensates for the heart disease up until the time where they drop dead. When we're talking about diagnostics for dilated cardiomyopathy, we have two that we can lean on. Um, first, we do have genetic screening. If there is a breed that is predisposed to developing DCM, having any dogs that are going to be used for breeding genetically screened is an absolute must. If we are suspecting that there is a DCM or another heart condition in a specific patient that's having symptoms and presenting to a vet clinic for that, the definitive way to test is with an echocardiogram. So this means that we take an ultrasound of the heart and usually this needs to be done by a veterinary cardiologist as they are the ones best able to read the images that they're seeing. Sometimes we will take chest x-rays um, to look for congestive heart failure but also to measure the size of the heart. If it is quite enlarged, it helps to narrow down our differential list, but it isn't a specific diagnostic for DCM. Sometimes if the dog or cat has had a fainting or syncopal episode, we might check what's called a Holter monitor that traces the heart rhythm to make sure that there aren't other arrhythmias that are causing problems. Regarding treatment, we do have a number of medications that can be used. If congestive heart failure is present, then we use diuretics to help to remove that excess fluid buildup. But the mainstay is really pimobendin. This medication does help with increasing the muscle contraction ability for the heart, um, and so your veterinarian may recommend that to you. There are also other medications that could be part of the treatment plan. It really depends on what specific symptoms your pet has and what stage of disease they end up being in. Unless the DCM is nutrition related, 
the prognosis is not good. This is a progressive and irreversible disease. With nutrition-related DCM, if they are caught early enough, we have had a number of patients that will have their heart disease reversed. And this is what makes it such a different phenomenon from all the other types of DCM. A number of decades ago, we actually had a lot of cats that were presenting with heart disease and it was at that time that researchers figured out that cats are unable to synthesize taurine in their own bodies and so it's very important that their nutrition contains a lot more taurine than dog nutrition does. And so ever since then, the standards for cat food have changed. Starting a few years before 2018, veterinary cardiologists were seeing an increase in the trend of DCM cases that they were having come into their practice. And the other thing that was abnormal about this is that it was a number of breeds that don't usually present with DCM. So the frequency of cases and the breed of patient that it was developing in were both abnormal and started triggering alarm bells. And then in 2018, this started to officially be looked into. The FDA got involved and they started um, putting out some statements about having concerns about there being a nutritionally related DCM. So of course it makes sense that the first thing that researchers thought of is, oh, maybe this is also taurine related because we have this past history of cats having an issue with getting taurine from their nutrition and how that caused DCM. And there was a thought, maybe this is the same problem with our dog food. Now dogs are obviously different than cats and they can make their own taurine if they're given the appropriate ingredients to do so. So their body is able to synthesize some taurine on its own. Taurine levels started being tested in all of these dogs and what we started finding was that a number of the patients that had DCM had normal taurine levels. And so now we know it may be contributing for some patients, but it's not the whole story. There are a number of unethical um, pet food companies that started advertising, oh, we've now supplemented taurine, so that's fixed the problem. But this is not true. Supplementation of taurine does not solve the issue for these pet foods. Before we move on to what is known about risk factors in pet nutrition, I'd like to remind you to please like this video and comment if you have any questions or if you have an idea for a future video topic. I'd love to hear from you. You may see online that we are categorizing at-risk diets as BEG diets. And so BEG stands for boutique, which means instead of funding nutrition research, they are advertising. Exotic, meaning that the ingredient list is containing proteins that we just don't have as much pet nutrition research on. It also could mean less researched ingredients like the pulse legumes. And then the G stands for grain-free because that does seem to be part of this picture as well. I should note here that there are some WSAVA compliant formulas that are prescription diets that may have exotic ingredients or that may technically be grain-free. However, with those diets, we are not finding animals are having issues. And the difference seems to be the amount of research that those companies are doing before producing those diets. The other very important trend to note is that the companies that produce WS AVA compliant nutrition are not having any cases of nutritionally related DCM. All of the cases thus far over the last number of years are from pets that are fed non-WS AVA compliant nutrition. That's why I covered what WSAVA standards are in part one of this series. I'll link that video here. If you haven't watched it, make sure you go back to watch it. This is also why veterinarians are now becoming a lot more insistent that we are feeding pets WSAVA compliant nutrition. And we're trying to protect our patients and prevent them from developing heart disease to the best of our ability. And we still haven't figured out exactly what the issue is. When the animals are switched to a WSAVA compliant diet, then you can see improvement and reversal of their heart structure changes. 
that's a big deal. And it's also wonderful because this is the first time that we've had the ability to reverse DCM. There are a number of brands that are way overrepresented, and so I will list a number of them for you on the screen now. So the current recommendation is that if you have a dog or a cat that has been fed non-WSAVA compliant nutrition, that the very first thing you need to do is contact your veterinarian and get some testing done. So it's likely that taurine levels will still be tested because some patients do require supplementation of it. And also seeing a veterinary cardiologist to have an echocardiogram done is necessary. And using the results of that echocardiogram, a treatment plan can be implemented. After the testing is done, it's important that your pet is blended over to a WSABA compliant nutrition immediately. We know that that switch does improve prognosis for these patients dramatically. And lastly, I would requests that you submit info to the FDA. It's important that the FDA gets as much information from as many pets as is possible. And we currently have a lot less information on how this is affecting our cats. However, veterinary nutritionists are recommending that all of these things are done for our cats as well. The thing that kind of complicates matters for cats is that they are genetically predisposed to another heart issue called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and that type of heart disease can result in very similar symptoms up to and including sudden death and we know that our cats receive less veterinary care and less referral veterinary care than our dogs do which is a shame. As I mentioned before, we don't currently fully understand what is causing this DCM in our pets. However, the current theory has found that perhaps there is something with the way these foods are being formulated that's just not getting the heart muscle, the micronutrients it needs to stay healthy. And so even though we don't fully understand the clinical picture, because pets are having a reversal of their heart disease when they're fed a WSAVA compliant diet, that is enough evidence for the majority of veterinarians to recommend making that switch promptly. I liken it a little bit to the unknowns that we have around how grapes affect our dogs. There are some dogs that will have eaten grapes for years because their people didn't know any better and they never have issues. Then there are other dogs that eat one grape and they have severe kidney disease, maybe even kidney failure, and they can die from it. There's this huge spectrum of how grapes affect our dogs and we don't fully understand why that is. It doesn't matter. I still recommend to all of my clients that they do not feed their dogs grapes. It is not worth the risk. That's the same with this situation and nutrition. I know you want to feed your pet the best thing possible. The best recommendation that I can make to you at this time is to feed a WSAVA compliant diet. It's what I do for my own pets and it's what I recommend you do for yours. Next video, I will be covering home cooked meals and what should be considered for those situations. I hope you'll join me and I'll see you then. Bye.